we are so thankful, aren't we, that we have a most glorious challenge that comes to us from our wonderful Savior as our shepherd and for God the Father who loved and made provisions for our salvation and for the precious Holy Spirit who comes within us. In other words, the Bible represents the Trinity of the Godhead as busy and active at trying to achieve as much as possible in the rescue operations of the tragedy of this world. And just think of our wonderful privilege to join into a movement that has been going on. And this is such a privilege to be sure. And so we consider the method must participate in God's loving purposes and activities. As we previously said, you can have a whole manual on method. And so in our one lecture, we can obviously only state some principles. However, we have said a good deal all along the line as to how we are to serve the Lord. And now we want to gather together some principles of the means in which God wants to work with us. And we have studied 1 Corinthians 3, 9 to 15. And that beautiful passage in verse 9 becomes our key of this section. We are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. And so we have uh, Paul and Peter uh, using the height of a building to represent the body of Christ or the church. And we are adding stones to the building. These stones are souls that are being worked with. And as we've studied in 1 Corinthians 3, we need to be sure that we're adding to the building uh, those stones that are real and that have been truly reconciled to God. So we're labors together with God or God's fellow workers. And think of the appeal that Paul expressed here, 2 Corinthians 5.20, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And so we're so thankful for what God is doing, are we not? And I was so damaged in my theological training, as I've indicated, when I was told that God had elected some to be saved and passed by others, when I was told that salvation was all of God, God could save anyone He wants to, all these things deeply hurt me. God's will was being done. If God didn't actually prefer sin, there was something almost the same. He permitted it, and He had a secret will and a revealed will. Oh, how this hurt me. I didn't imagine such a thing before. I felt that God was opening his being to us in the Bible without any reservations. And so these things really hurt me as I pursued in these studies. And I longed to see what I could from God's word. But I had these great weights upon my heart and upon my mind. So I'm so grateful to God that we cannot outdo God. We should never pray, O oh God, if it be thy will, save so-and-so. This is not an intelligent prayer at all. And we can be so glad that God tells us in his word that it is his will that everyone would be saved. It was his will that sin should never enter the world in the first place. And so in the study of the scripture, this has been such a blessed revision in my thinking. And we are not to go out in our own strength, of course, as we realize the great problems of winning souls. And so we need to try to see what God is trying to do, how God has approached the matter, how the New Testament church approached the matter of salvation, and then something how the Holy Spirit is operating in the church now, something about the gifts of the Spirit and the operations of the Spirit. We need to assemble some basic things that God has revealed to us in his precious word. So we have the first question, what is, are the members of the Godhead seeking to accomplish? And I am so glad to believe exactly what we have read here and what the scripture tells us. We have studied that there was no plan of God that sin should enter the world, it just couldn't be. God has created man to be a habitation of God through the spirit and so forth and so on. 
Jesus prayed, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Obviously, this means that God's will is not being done on earth. And that's such a, a revealing thing to see. And sometimes people can't come to God because they think God's will is being done. And we need to show them that God's will is not being done on earth. And this quite often removes a great barrier of thought. Because I don't know who could travel the world and not want changes. And if God wants the status quo at this particular time, that is the most depressing thought we can ever have, it would seem. And so it is the objective of God that the whole world should be saved. Oh, how blessed this is to think about. Dear Jesus mentioned in John 3, 17, what his purpose was in coming into the world. Most of us memorize that beautiful verse 16 as our first uh, memory. God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, was already judged because they had rejected the evidences they had, but that the world should be saved through him. And so we don't, never need to think we can outdo God. We should never pray for revival as though we want revival more than God. We should never conceive of prayer as trying to induce God to do more than he's doing with any concept that God will be inactive and needs to be stirred up to action. These are simply not biblical concepts, as we know, and we're so glad of them. The key passage of our message was that all men should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. We saw the word knowledge was a knowledge of experience. Not only this, but it was a perfect knowledge grounded in experience. And we're so glad to read that God is no respecter of persons. This is what Peter observed, wasn't it, when he came to the household of Cornelius and he saw the way God was dealing and, and working as much as he could to try to influence as many as he could. And so he said in Acts 10.34, uh, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. He does not prefer one above the other. He does not have any election without any reason for it. And he said, uh, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Anyone who is willing to rethink his position and have a change of living, uh, God is deeply concerned. And when we take this verse to indicate that God will do something very, very remarkable to anyone in the whole world, that will, it will rise to thought and recognize the operation of the Spirit because the Spirit is operating throughout the whole world. And so we can be so grateful for the revelations that deliver us from these terrifying complications against our wonderful God. And uh, Romans 2.11, Paul sums up here, as we've said, there is no partiality with God, no preferring one above another. And we're so thankful that the atonement was made for everyone. Uh, God certainly can't invite everyone if there's not a provision in the atonement for everyone. So it is so beautiful to see that God does invite everyone. And he has sent us out, hasn't he? as in the commission in Mark, uh, chapter 16 there. And that uh, we are sent out uh, to invite everyone to come. And this, of course, means that salvation has been provided to everyone. Verse 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved refuses the evidence uh, shall be condemned. And so we have the beautiful concept we also had the beautiful statement in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5 and 6, how the Lord Jesus is the mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, and how he gave himself a ransom for all. How precious is the love of God, the desire of God to invite everyone into his heart and try to reason and bring about an adjustment so God might be able to bless us and so he gave himself, Jesus said, a ransom for all. Then we saw in the great use of propitiation, he is the propitiation for the sins of the whole world. And so we see that this was no kind of a literal payment of any sort. Otherwise, the whole world would be saved, of course. And so we saw that dear Jesus, in his sacred atonement, has solved the problems. He did what had to be done so God could exercise his mercy as he already wanted to do. And so we see that man's will determines the result. And we're so glad for the declaration down through the centuries 
You go back and read early church history, you don't find any other concept than man's responsibility represented. It seems like you have to go back to Augustine around 400 to find the concept of a dead will which can't obey God. And this is so comforting, you know, and this is why, one reason why it's been promoted, of course, through the centuries, it's so comforting if we don't want to believe God, it's so comforting to believe that we can't. And we can never bring ourselves under intelligent conviction, of course, if we think we can't obey God. And so we see the scripture telling us that it is our, it's our reaction to the grace of God that determines the result. And this is what we have again and again, uh, John 3, for example, uh, verse, verse 36, we have, he who believes, and these are present tenses, he who is believing in the Son is having eternal life. But he who is disobeying, that's a little different word there, you know, it's not disbelieving, it's disobeying. And as we've seen that believe and obey are equated in the matter of the gospel. But he who is disobeying, uh, uh, the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God is abiding upon him. So it is man's reaction to God's grace then that determines the result. And Jesus said in John 7, 17, he said, If any man is willing to do his will, he shall know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I am speaking myself. In other words, he shall have the evidence from God of the positive revelation that God is making. And then we're so glad that the book of Revelation closes with this sweet invitation 22 and verse 17, and the spirit and the bride. As we mentioned, we are the bride of Christ down here. And we are to join with the Holy Spirit as he goes throughout the whole world. Come and let us, and so come and let uh, one who is thirsty come and let one who wishes take the water of life without cost. One who wishes. And so we see that God must achieve our willingness uh, to this Wonderful salvation he wants to bring about. Now we have the question to study a little further. How is a person brought to repentance and salvation? It seems like any week you want to listen to the radio in America, you can hear the statement, salvation is all of God. Now salvation is just not all of God. And anyone can find this out by reading the New Testament, it would appear. And the Old, the Old Testament too. And we have such great evidences of this effect. Of course, those who say this are making a theological deduction. This is a deductive method of studying the Bible. You first establish your propositions, and then you go and try to reinforce them. This is not the inductive method of research being pursued in every endeavor. And as we come to the scripture to see how a soul is saved, we find out there are three agents in this salvation. This is an old proclamation. You read it back and finish systematic theology. It was heralded through the great revivals of the past that man does have a part and we Christians have a part. We're not mere instruments. We are active agents in the furtherance of God's work. Now here we must take two sections and work them together. Remember we had in your section 10 on the transformation, we had a section there on your page 7 and your item 7 at the bottom of the page. A reference to how the, new, how the new birth or the transformation actually takes place. And here we see again that there are three agents in transformation. And here again we have the matter before us. How is a person brought to repentance and salvation? And so here we have in these two sections a similar discussion. In our present uh, section we're talking about the broad viewpoint as to how his soul is brought into salvation. In the section on transformation, we were talking about a specific part of salvation, the part of transforming our being. So you see they are so closely related, we can talk about them both at once. And that's what we will proceed to try to sum up. And so we say there are three agents in salvation. You remember Melanchthon. Uh, a, a very important Lutheran writer, uh, the principal author of the Lutheran documents of the early Reformation, 1535, he decided to go against Luther's concept of the bondage of the will and said there were three, there are three elements in salvation, he said. There's the Holy Spirit, there's the word of truth, and there's the will of man. 
who either accepts the operations of the Spirit and the truth or rejects them. And so, so we see that it's a, it's a continuous discussion down through the ages that there are these elements of uh, these agencies in salvation and that salvation is a transforming process of reconciliation and, and uh, transformation that uh, there are these three agents involved in this matter. And so first and foremost, of course, everyone agrees to this, that the Holy Spirit is active in regeneration. Now we're on your MD and your page two. And here the Holy Spirit is enlightening every man that comes into the world. We have read this in John 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, the Holy Spirit is active throughout the whole world and he's using uh, natural observations to impress people and, and to firmly fix upon their minds that there has to be a reason for all the amazing existences they see. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. And so again we read uh, how Jesus said concerning the Holy Spirit that uh, he would convince the world of sin and so forth. And we know the Holy Spirit is trying to restrain sin on every hand. We read this in Genesis 6-3. We have this in Stephen's declaration in Acts 7 and verse 51. How the Holy Spirit has been resisting sin and trying to oppose uh, every single person wanting to live in a selfishness, a selfish state of being. And so Stephen said, Ye men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. So we have the Holy Spirit operating and, and bringing conviction of sin. Jesus said when he comes into the world, he's going to convict the world of sin. In other words, he's operating throughout the whole world, uh, making it difficult to reject evidence and to continue in selfishness. And also he's manifesting the love of God as we've seen. And Jesus said in his thought, in his prophecy of the crucifixion, in the John 12, 32, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. So we see the operations of the Godhead as we previously discussed. And so he's seeking to persuade all individuals, isn't he, to come to the beautiful submission of God's truth. How thankful we are for this great measure. Now let's go over to the other section and see how the Holy Spirit is active specifically in the transformation of our hearts and lives. And there, of course, it is the Holy Spirit who must give spiritual life, we say. Spiritual birth. We can't conceive of anything, uh, any comparison to the importance of the Holy Spirit giving spiritual birth. Jesus mentioned born from above, didn't he? Born of the Spirit and so on. We have these different expressions throughout the, the New Testament. How the Holy Spirit is the one who gives life and, and bestows and restores the beautiful manifestations of God that God has planned in the precious gospel. And so we see that the Holy Spirit is this great activator in this whole process of transformation. We know that no one who is born of God sins. We're reading 1 John 5, 18. But he who is born of God or born out of from God uh, keeps him and the evil one does not touch him. And so the Holy Spirit is active in the new birth, isn't he? He creates and makes alive together with. We're made alive together with Christ, we're told. He cleanses our hearts as we come to the gospel. And uh, we have this beautiful statement in, in Titus 2 and verse 14. Who gave himself for us, speaking of Jesus, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous of good, good deeds. And so it's the Holy Spirit who purifies and transforms us, is it not? We have the concept of washing, the washing of regeneration we read about in Titus chapter 3, do we not? And it's the Holy Spirit who does this remarkable thing uh, as uh, we are brought with him uh, to the sacred atonement of Jesus, as we've said. It is the Holy Spirit who sanctifies us, and purifies our heart. We have Jesus saying this in John 17, 17. And uh, we are sanctified through the truth. And the Holy Spirit is the agent of the Godhead in doing this. Jesus prays, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. 
So the Holy Spirit takes the beautiful gospel and, and applies it and purifies our hearts. We have the beautiful concept of the church in, in Ephesians 5, 26, and how there has been this purification of the Holy Spirit that has uh, provided us the situation where we can enjoy God. Uh, we have this, verse 25, Christ also loved the church, gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by washing of water with the word. In passing, here we have a reference to water and word. As you know, there's a difference of opinion between what Jesus meant here in John chapter 3, born of water and of the Spirit. And we have a number of folk who say that you have to be born of water baptism and use this as a, as a reference point of this matter. And uh, we suggest that we look at this passage in, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26, where obviously water here is referred as a figure of speech. So uh, I understand Jesus in this, in this matter of the, his reference in John 3, as using water as a symbol of purification and washing. Washing and regeneration, the whole concept of an illustration here. And then we have the, this beautiful little statement in 526 of Ephesians, washing of water with the word. And so this would indicate that the Holy Spirit is active in this wonderful purifying situation. Then uh, we had in Titus 3, 5, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And in that beautiful passage in Ephesians 4.23, we are to be renewed continually in the spirit of our minds. So it's the Holy Spirit who does this renewal from beginning to end. So of course, first and foremost and always, it is the operation of the Holy Spirit who brings us to realization and transforms us when we're willing to come to this realization. But now we need to see that we as Christians are very, very important agents in the winning of souls. We're not mere instruments, as some want to seem to represent it. And so we have a part in this great transformation now. We choose to do with our, our time uh, as uh, we make decisions. Are we going to engage ourselves for others, or are we going to simply cultivate our own happiness? This is the choice we must make, isn't it? And so we have the ability to become agents. The difference between an agent and an instrument, of course, is the matter of will. Uh, we have different instruments that have no will of their own. They simply have to be moved around. And that is not the way we are as representing Christ. We're agents. We choose to activate ourselves and to do things and accomplish things to uh, the praise of God's blessing. So we are more than mere uh, instruments and we are active in what we try to do and look at Paul's commission here look at his activity as in Acts uh, uh, 26 18 to 20 and here is what God told him to do as he called him and gave him his commission and we see that he was a very positive actor in the salvation of souls Verse 17, he delivered you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you. What was he to do? To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God, in order that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Then Paul says, I could have disobeyed this great vision, but I didn't. I chose to submit to it. And he says, I kept declaring both to those at Damascus first, also Jerusalem, then throughout the region of Judea, and to the Gentiles, that they should be repenting and turn to God. Have a rethinking of your situation. Try to sit down with people and have them reason out their situation. And, uh, and have such a turn that you're happy to perform deeds appropriate to repentance, in other words. To satisfy their minds and to exert every opportunity of trying to win souls. Now let us look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And in this passage, Paul is telling us uh, that we need to kind of adapt ourselves to those we're trying to win. In other words, 
the idea of the monks getting off on a mountain somewhere and living their own life in some kind of a spiritual devotion is not God's idea. God wants us to have some way of contacting the unsaved. But here we have to be exceedingly careful that we may prayerfully draw the line between an endeavor to contact and a partaking of their deeds. And we must be very, very cautious in, in the methods we may use. And this is the most back of our endeavor of the coffee shop, is it not? To have a place of interest for people uh, where we can offer something uh, from our heart and, and just sit down and have conversation with people. And this is an endeavor, is it not? To, to have the world, to, to have a meeting place with the world. So they, they will have a point of contact. And this is what Paul seems to put forth here in the 1 Corinthians chapter 9. One of the terrible mistakes of mission endeavors is the, is the, seems to be the lack of ability of most missionaries to go in and live like the natives they're trying to win. And so quite often they go in and set up a great big establishment with servants and everything else. Or they have all the modern facilities along with them. And the poor natives look at this great big situation and wonder what they're trying to do. And obviously they're not, being, they're not mingling with the people in their level. If we can't mingle with people on their level, it's almost no use going to them. And one thing for sure, there's got to be some kind of a great compromise in any servants of the Lord. I think we can almost make this as a principle, certainly in our so-called comforts of our of the civilized life that we have, if we are going to serve others, we can't live above them in any sense. And we almost got to live below them if we're going to convince them that we want to help them. We simply must convince them, like Paul says, I, want, I don't want yours, I want you. And as long as people may conclude that we want theirs, there'll be no ministry. So here's a great difficulty in trying to compromise some way to live as normally with those we're trying to win as possible. This is very difficult. Uh, most of us maybe can't do this. And we have to seek what we can do. But this is Paul's principle here, which he's talking about in this ninth chapter. And look at verse 19 to 22, which kind of sums this up. For though I am free from all men, he says, I have made myself a slave to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became a Jew that I might win Jews, to those who are under the law as under the law. He made certain adaptations, did he not? And though not being myself under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. Here are certain compromises he made. To those who are without law as without law, and though not being without law to God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those who are without law. And then here's the great principle. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men that I may by all means save some. And so if we're going to have a contact with people, we've got to make some kind of a compromise. We've got to have some means of contacting them. And uh, we must pray about this, mustn't we? Because God wants us to be lights in the world. We are the temples of the Holy Spirit. There's no earthly temple now. And that this principle, and we need to be very prayerful in this, of course, that we don't uh, go over the line and, and uh, partake of their situations. And as Scripture indicates, we have to rescue certain souls with great fear, lest we also get involved again in the situation from which we have been delivered. Now uh, we have this beautiful concept of prayer, don't we? Let's go back to your section 10 there now again. And here we have some suggestions too. As we see that we are to uh, have this great pursuit of, of witnessing. But before we get into this, let's look at a remarkable thing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 15, the Apostle Paul uses this verb to give birth to concerning himself. Now those Bible teachers who say that salvation is all of God should consider this. 
Here's the same verb to give birth to, the same climactic tense. When Jesus said, the Holy Spirit gives birth to you, Paul says, I also gave birth to you. Which certainly means a deep involvement, does it not? He says here, for though you have countless tutors or instructors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I became your father. I did give birth to you in Christ Jesus. Through the gospel. In other words, just as parental affection gives birth to new lives in the world, so Paul says, I took souls upon my heart, I travailed over them, I labored over them, I gave myself for them in such an intimate way that I have a part in their new birth. And that's very interesting, isn't it? The same verb, the same tense. So obviously salvation is not all of God, is it? We have a part in it. We're not mere instruments. We have a part of concern. We take souls upon our heart. We labor over them. We pray over them. We try to listen to them, try to help them, and bring them into the precious relationship with God. Look at Philemon. This is a beautiful picture of personal work, isn't it? Here we have dear Paul in prison. And he comes against this slave who had run away from his master. And he finds him in prison with him. And he takes this slave upon his heart. And we can just be sure he spent hours and hours with him. And then he says in verse 10, Now he's writing to the owner of the slave, you remember Philemon, and pleading with Philemon to be merciful to Onesimus. And here we have this verb again to give birth to. And what a beautiful picture of personal work. Verse 10, I appeal to you for my child, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, Onesimus. My child whom I did give birth to in my imprisonment, Onesimus. So we see that we have an active part in salvation of the souls. And they, we are not mere instruments, but we have an active choice to, to do what we want to do with ourselves and, and the application of our being and then we see the place of prayer. Oh my, how involved and precious is this opportunity of prayer. And so Paul says, God sent me out to witness. We'll converse about that a little more in a moment. He sent me out to persuade, to try to reason, to try to meet people and think with them and become a part of them. In other words, the idea of salvation is we becoming somewhat of a part of the people we're trying to win and getting involved with them in some way that we are trying to win. And this is what dear Jesus did too, didn't he? They accused him of, of sitting down and eating with sinners. And uh, Jesus said, well, uh, I didn't come to call the righteous to repentance. I came to call those to repentance who needed to have this repentance. And so dear Jesus gave us this example of involvement, did he not, in the situations and problems and troubles with others. We're not to live in some kind of isolation then of sanctity. We'll have a lot of time to do this, so we give it to the Lord, of course. And now's the opportunity to reach souls. Here's the, here's the operation of prayer. Now look at how Paul chose to spend his life. He could spend his life from morning to then shouting the glory of God, couldn't he? He could climb up in the mountains and shout God's glory without any limit, couldn't he? All the wonderful things God gave him to experience. But he says, I didn't do this with my life. Here's the way I live my life, Paul says, as in Romans 9. I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. And I could wish that I myself were a curse, separate from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He's not going around the world shouting and glorifying God, is he? He's not going around the world laughing and acting as though there's no problems, is he? He said, I've uns I could just shout the glory of God from morning to light. He said, uh, I'm sure I don't know what I should do. Uh, I I'd rather be with Christ. That would be far better. Uh, but it doesn't make any difference what I do. If I'm here, I live for Jesus. If I go there, I live for Jesus. And so I'm here because of what the God might do through me here. And so he says, what am I going to do? I'll have all eternity to shout the glory of God, but now's the time to be burdened, like Jesus did. And the dear Jesus said, I don't want you to spend the whole day shouting and praising God. I want you to do what I'm concerned with, the salvation of souls. So he said, take up your cross daily and follow me and be burdened with what I'm burdened with. And that's what Paul did, you see. You just can't fit together a lot of things going on in Christian circles today, can you? And so dear Paul is choosing to be concerned choosing to be 
prayerful. And mark, let us see this great meaning of prayer. And so we say that prayer makes a difference. Now I think we can almost say, with very few exceptions, I think, in salvation, every one of us who gets saved are saved because God did more for us than he did for somebody else. That God singles out in a sense. And the reason he could do this was that there were free voluntary agents like Paul who chose to be concerned, chose not to spend his time shouting happiness, but chose to do what Jesus did to pick up the load of, of sinners and their awful destination. He says, knowing therefore the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. And because he prayed and exerted himself, God can do more for those for whom he prayed than he could otherwise do. I've been blessed with this idea for a number of years. Prayer enables God to be partial impartially. This prayer enables God to give special attention to some souls without being accused of preferring one above the other. Because there are independent agents that God can point to, and when the devil comes to God, says, see, I see you've you're changed your methods, haven't you? You're doing more for one than another. I see you've changed your principle. Didn't you say you were impartial? And then God says, see here, Satan, you want to take a few thousand mile trip with me? You want to go to some closet over here somewhere? You want to see a prayer place here? You want to see a little stool in here? Where, where saints of God are down in the face before God praying for this person you're blaming me for? And Satan knows the answer right away. I got so blessed a few months ago over the idea that God runs a prayer bank. You can go and deposit $1,000 in the name of anybody you want to, can't you? And when we get down on our face in sincere love and prayer, God writes a deposit for the souls we're praying for. And those souls can come to this bank and draw out on our prayer deposit. And so God does more for one than another because free agents choose to be uncomfortable, choose to be burdened, choose to pray. Yes, God runs a prayer bank. And sometimes this deposit can last. George Mueller, that dear saint of prayer, is said to pray for certain people for 50 years before they really submit it to Christ. Puts most all of us to shame, doesn't it? Prayer bank. So we have the opportunity of prayer, do we not? In winning souls to Christ. So we have a, a real part in their salvation then. We just can't say a few words about what the subject has to do. We've rather completely discussed this. And so the subject has to respond to truth, does he not? God is working with the subject. We Christians are working with the subject with God. And so the subject has to wake from sleep and arise from the dead as you have in Ephesians 5.14 and Christ will shine to you. There has to be this repentance and turning to Christ as we've said. Then back to your section 10. And look how much the subject has to do here. Look what the scripture says. The subject has to do. Quickly, he must open the door of his needy heart. He must apply eye salve to his dull spiritual vision. In humility, he must receive the implanted word of God. He must wash himself. These are the verbal expressions. He must purify himself by coming to the sacred cross of Jesus, of course. He must cleanse himself. You see how much the subject has to do he has to be willing to pursue sanctification. He has to eat or drink and partake of Christ, as we've discussed. He has to put off the old way of living and put on the new, doesn't he? He has to content to self-crucifixion, where comes the old man, the world, the, the, the emotions, and so on. So we see the subject has a tremendous thing to do. And God's never going to cause anybody to be saved, of course. Uh, he can't do this. 
we said that there's only one thing God can't do. He can't make anybody love him. And this is what we have to do. And of course, the three agents have one great instrument, the truth of the word of God, and particularly the sacred atonement and love of Jesus. So we have at the bottom of this, uh, this consideration in your section 10, the Holy Spirit illumines and applies the sufferings of Christ and bestows spiritual life. The servant of Christ proclaims, prays, and influences with compassionate firmness of persuasion. Do you think in the future of these two words, compassionate firmness? Either one will not work. It won't work to have firmness without compassion. It won't work to have compassion without firmness. These two went together, dear Jesus, didn't they? They must go together in our work. We can't just get emotional. This won't work. And we can't be rigid either. This will freeze them over. So there has to be this domination, compassionate firmness. And the subject is drawn to the suffering heart of Christ in agony of guilt and actively partakes of the remedy. And here we have the glorious result of the salvation the grace of God. How sweet and how precious to think about. Oh, we have a great privilege, friends, don't we, to work with our great, wonderful God and to choose to be uncomfortable now and to choose to defer our great times of happiness now and be busy about our great efforts. Dear Charles Feeney, you know his great lie. There were sent to 100,000 converts here in the greater Rochester, New York area in one year. These are 100,000 that joined the churches there, mainly the Presbyterian churches and the, the Baptist churches and so on. And just think the great movement. And he said a happy Christian is never usually a very useful one. Of course, this means what we've been talking about uh, in our own hearts, we just be perfectly rejoicing and gloriously praising God. But then Jesus is, is busy, and we can't, we can't be without busyness and, and live with Him, can we? It depends on what God is doing, you see. If God's will is being done, then relax, retire. But if God is not relaxed, if He's busy, then you can't retire to nothing. When God is busy, He'll leave you behind, won't He? And you won't have the fellowship with Him. How evident and how lovely. Now we can only say a few words about some of these things we wish we could converse longer upon. Let us look at your page two then and your item three. Here we have something of what God's manner approach has been. And we've said a good deal about this, haven't we? God says, come now, let us reason together. He, he pleads with, with the, through the prophets. Uh, I don't think we've read Micah yet, sixth chapter, two and three. Here we have God coming to the prophet and so I want you to ask the people, why don't they love me? Uh, reason with them. See if they can find any reason. And he says in verse 2, Listen, you mountains, to the indi indictments of the Lord, and you who enduring foundation of the earth, because the Lord has a case against his people, even with Israel he will dispute. He'll reason. He'll try to, to find out some reason. My people. Can you imagine God saying this? My people, what have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? Answer me. Why don't you love me? Can't you find any reason why you don't love me? Oh, isn't this a moving thing for God to, to reveal to us? And so we have God coming with such a reasonableness, don't we? And we give you quite a number of instances uh, on your page three, uh, how God does come in his many approaches of reason and great to try to, try to give reasons for all his activity. Uh, he came to uh, Abraham about Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, here's why I have to do this. And uh, Abraham prayed God down to 10, and he might have gone lower if Abraham's faith hadn't run out. And so here we have the great compassion of God, don't we? Coming over, oh, how lovely to see. Here's Moses reasoning with God at the terrible golden calf situation. And so we go down this list and how God wants to come to us in our situation and try to uh, lead us to be reasonable and understanding. What was the approach of the apostles and early church leaders, we ask, and here we again have the same patient, loving approach. None of this quickie method, it seems, of salvation has come to be in our day, but rather a taking time to just sit down with people and have them listen to what God had to do to bring about this great salvation. And so we see their approach, do we not? And we give you a number of instances on your page four and how they, how Stephen, with his great anointing of God, reasons with them they can't find any against him the only thing you can do is kill him because they can't answer him, can they? And what did they say? 
Here, they could not resist the spirit and the wisdom by which he spoke. And so the only thing they could do in their defeat was to get rid of him. Then we have, dear Paul, you know these different passages. You have in Acts 17, for example, 2 and 3. Here he comes to Thessalonica, and he reasons with the people. You again have him reasoning in Athens, 17, 16 and 17. You have him reasoning at Corinth, 18, chapter, verse 4 and so on. Likewise at Ephesus, Acts 19. And we want to look at one uh, expression here uh, in the 24th of Acts, in verse 25. Because here we have moral government, uh, obviously, being presented uh, to this ruler here. So here is Felix, who asked Paul how to be saved. Paul doesn't tell him to believe. He reasons with him about the principles of moral government here. And verse 25, and as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. He was describing to Felix what salvation was like. He wasn't trying to get him to believe here. He was reasoning of the principles of God, wasn't he? And Felix became frightened and said, Go away for the present. When I have time, I will summon you. And that time never came, it appears. And so we have God, uh, Paul, and the early church leaders reasoning and persuading. They didn't accuse Paul of being ignorant, did they? They accused him of having much learning. So obviously he is trying to uh, present understandably the beautiful, wonderful things of God. Now we must inquire uh, in your item five how the great operations of God are brought to pass in our life. Because how can we think of accomplishing anything without God's presence and working with us? And Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. And when they began to understand what salvation is, they said, oh my Lord, how is this ever going to be possible? And Jesus said, with man it is impossible, but not with God. Because with God all things are possible. This would give us the idea that salvation is a tremendous thing, is it not? And requires a, a great exercise of energy and power. And so we see the many things that uh, God is doing. Uh, at the top of your page 5, we have an exciting passage concerning Paul. Uh, we have Colossians 1.29. as such a moving passage to be sure. And Paul says, I am striving, I am laboring. But there's a God is in back of me, pushing me, and, and with great energy. And so we might render it like we give you, unto which I am continually laboring, he says, toiling, continually struggling, he said. I'm giving my every energy, but I'm struggling toward the energy of God coming in me, operating in me with power. Oh, my, what a statement. I often thought, you've seen the great big crawler tractors, haven't you, with the big bulldozer in front. And they want to push a great big mountain of dirt and, and they start to get stalled and, and the crawler tracks start to slip and it would dig itself down and, and it gets stalled with this great thing. So we usually have in construction, as you may have seen, a, a pusher tractor, we say, a great big powerful unit with a big plate on the front and there's a plate on the back of the, of the, of the tractor with the bulldozer. And so when the thing gets stuck, we bring this pusher tractor up and the two tractors just push the thing right on through. Praise the Lord. I got to thinking, that's what Paul is talking about here. He says, I'm grinding away. I'm just working away. I'm pushing all I can. And then, but I'm not pushing my own strength. He says, there is God who's pushing behind me. He says, God is working in me in power, pushing me through. Now, where will you find excitement like this? Anywhere in the world, my friends. To feel as we put ourselves to the grindstone and do we can. Jesus is in the Holy Spirit's back of us, pushing us, praise the Lord. Or anything like this to be experienced. Look at the second paragraph. And we said that there is no single filling of the Holy Spirit, of course. These are climaxes. Now, the fourth chapter of Acts is a very, very chapter of great power, isn't it? And Peter is challenged here. Here this lame man had been healed, and, and uh, things are going bad against the religious leaders. So we've got to get rid of this man, Peter, and, and so on. And Peter had, realizes the opportunity. And we have in 4.8, Peter having been filled with the Holy Spirit. Here's the same climactic verb as occurs on Pentecost. And Peter knows he can't store up the fullness of the Spirit. So Peter, looking to God for victory, Peter having been filled, spoke in this way. And we've talked about the way he spoke and how the power of God came down over him 
And my, what a prayer meeting they had. You go to verse 31, they're all filled all over again with the Holy Spirit. And they're there enthused and excited. They're preaching to each other. Glory to God, my brother, sister, friend. We're on victory side, praise the Lord. And so they're preaching to each other, aren't they? Admonishing each other. Because they're all filled all over again with the Holy Spirit. And so we are not to think there's any one filling of the Spirit. We can't store up this. We said we can't live under it. And we have an opportunity. Often think of Samson, how he got so far away from God, but he did come back to God. And he said, just once more, Lord, and let me get a hold of these pillars, and, and I'll pull this thing down. And I'm going to look to you for, for power and for victory. And so there was one great heave whereby he looked to God, and God gave him his strength back again, and have victory over the enemies of the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament times. I often thought of that. Oh, God, let me like Samson just take all once more of some of the pillars uh, on which unbelief and agnosticism and godlessness are, are building. And, and let us get hold of them and pull them down. Paul says we're fighting, uh, we're fighting an offensive battle. We're not on defense. My, how can we uh, quit discussing these things when God is so much to inspire us with? And we must distinguish, we say, between the gift or bestowment of the Holy Spirit uh, and, the, and the many, many gifts of the Holy Spirit that God wants to bring about in our lives. We've talked a good deal about the bestowment of the Spirit, and now let us say a few words about the wonderful gifts of the Spirit. Your two in parentheses now on your page five describes the program of the church as we talked about to some extent. God wants us as the body of Christ to function as a unit, doesn't he? We're not to want to do what others are doing. We're trying to find out what God wants us to do. And then we're to look to the Holy Spirit for guidance that the whole body of Christ is supposed to march as a unit and they're supposed to love each other and be motivated by the precious love of Christ. Uh, we, have the, we are told to covet the greater gifts of the Spirit down about the seventh line up from the bottom. Covet earnestly the best gifts. We read in 1 Corinthians 12, 31. These best gifts seem to have to do with understanding and wisdom so we can tell with God people what God is like and what salvation is like and what Jesus had to do and what they have to do and what God will do when they do what they have to do. And so we, this seems to be the great thing we're to reach out for. As I understand the gifts, we ought to reach out for the greater gifts. And these seem to have to do with understanding God, as we've said, so we can go out in the name of Jesus, sit down with people, explain the mysteries of the Lord, and represent God in true sense. Then we see the many operations of the gifts of the Spirit. Over on your page six now. And here we see something remarkable and so important. Oh, is this important for us to think about. We have seemingly many individuals who think God gives them gifts of the Spirit for them to carry around and use like they want to. In other words, they seem to conceive of gifts of the Spirit that God gives us to walk around with and do what we want with them. And this leads to pride of the unthinkable order, doesn't it? I was preaching in Detroit a number of years ago, and the pastor of a large church was supposed to have made a plane trip. And now was supposed to have the gifts of the Spirit carried back on the plane. And it seemed like this congregation is about to worship this pastor. Here was this, the, the idea was, made the trip, and now he's carrying back the gifts of the Spirit. Wouldn't it be deflating to see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 4 to 11, that we have the operations of the Spirit. We have present tenses. Not aorist tenses of giving some kind, but present tense of operation. And if the Spirit of God doesn't come back with people, uh, they'll have no gifts when they get back. Because the Holy Spirit is operating, present tenses. Oh, how sweet and lovely. Here are these lighting fixtures here. You turn off the switch, there's nothing left, is there? This is the idea. So the energy of the power from the station is operating in these light fixtures. This is the idea of gifts of the Spirit. They're operations of the Spirit. Not independent pursuit of any kind. This is why so many are claiming gifts of the Spirit that don't work and do things like they claim. And this is something very profound, is it not? And we need to be right square down on our face before God when we think of any gifts of the Spirit. This is not an elevation of some kind of humiliation, isn't it? And so you see how much we learn here. At the top of your page, we try to say this, don't we? And here we have some present tenses. Now to each one 
is being given the manifestation of the Spirit toward that which is profitable. Present tense is being given. For to this one, through the Spirit, is being given a word of wisdom. To another, a word of knowledge. And so on, through the same Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is operating in us as His children, is giving us His manifestation. And if He shuts off His manifestation, we have nothing but memory. Friends, this is unthinkably important to think about. Very humiliating, isn't it? To think that we're not exclusive people. We're not carrying around in our beings what the, some think they are doing. We are supposed to be simply like voices, like John. Who are you, John the Baptist? I'm nobody. I'm a voice. Who are you, Paul? I'm nothing. Who are you, Peter? I'm an under-shepherd, he says. When the chief shepherd shall appear, then shall we also have this lovely time with him. So we see this humiliation doing not in the service of God. And so we, this is the idea. Now here's one place, as we said, where the Holy Spirit is absolutely sovereign. He simply decides what kind of gifts he wants to give at any particular time in the world history. And that we read in verse 11, and we tried to give you that little rendering there. Now all these things is working the one and the same Spirit, distributing or dividing into parts. Here the Holy Spirit is dividing into parts, what he's trying to do, separating to each one according as he is willing as he decides. So I conclude that I'm not supposed to ask God for specific gifts. I'm supposed to follow the procedure of reaching out for the greater gifts, coming to God's word in prayer and study, and praying for the Holy Spirit to operate in my mind that I might come, come to the closest possible to the truth of God, that I might go out and explain to people what God is like. And then we are to humble ourselves in prostration. And if God can trust us with manifestation, friends, I don't know where you're going to be at 10 years from now if, if the Lord tarries and so on. I have no idea where I might be. And it doesn't matter. Here we have the great concept of operations. And if God can trust us with things and you get into different spheres of, of pressures and complications, where's the limit of what God can do? We are the limit of what God can do. If we get down on our face before God so God can trust us, who can imagine what he might do? Praise the Lord. How do you feel? Do you feel like you've accomplished something? I like to think, in closing, of this man in Mark, chapter 9. And this represents my heart, and I trust it will represent yours. Here this man comes to the disciples about his son. Verse 17 of Mark 9. He says, Teacher, I have this problem with my son. He's possessed of an evil spirit. He came to his disciples. They couldn't cast him out. And Jesus said, oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? And then he comes to Jesus, and Jesus asks him this. Uh, in, in, you have uh, in verse 21 and so on, and uh, he answers from childhood. And now he said, and it is often thrown in me, describes what happens. And then here's the statement. But if you can do anything, take pity and honor and help us. Jesus didn't like that word, if thou canst. This was not a faith, if thou canst. And so he, he repeats, he replies to the, to the man, if thou can, if all things are possible, him who believes. And then here's the prayer of this man, which is so meaningful to me. Immediately the boy's father cried out and began saying, I do believe, help me in my unbelief. Here are two present tenses. One stating what he's doing, the other asking Jesus to keep on doing something great. He said, I am believing. I'm taking every ounce of my faith that I've got and I'm putting it to work, he said. I am believing. But I don't have anything like I should need to have. Jesus, won't you keep on increasing my faith? So I may have an ever greater measure of faith. I am believing. I'm putting everything I got to work, he said. But it's not enough. Won't you keep on coming? Don't give me a little push, but keep right on cultivating my lack of faith so it may grow to the dimensions that I see I want. Friend, do you feel that way? Do you feel that you want to put every ounce you've got to serve Jesus? 
Can we say we are believing? Do you feel you've arrived someplace? Or do we all want to get down before God and say, Dear sweet Jesus, cultivate my faith. Help me to grow where you can trust me with greater and greater things. And keep on doing this, dear Jesus. I haven't arrived yet. Just like Paul says, I'm reaching on ever upward to greater and greater things.